Uh, thank you very much. I actually figured it was because uh, we ran out of money for the speakers that had to fly, and so we talked the local guy into to doing it. Um, uh, one note, if you're looking for my presentation, there isn't one. Um, I just found it's easier, it's less work for me, and you're all looking at your phones anyway, so it like works for both of us um, as a way to get started. Um, so I'll talk through that. As a way to begin, I would like to note that my comments um, are my own personal opinions, and any representation or reflection that it might resemble my company's opinion is purely coincidental. Um, <laughs> stay employed, check. Um, I, I would also like to uh, remind you that somehow in here I might make any forward-looking statements, Dr. Glassman, um, and uh, they are subject to risk factors and uh, may cause actual results to differ from any estimates. And I suggest you refer to our fourth quarter est uh, quarterly statements or any other SEC filings for a discussion of those risk factors. Stay out of jail, check. Okay. <laughs> so. What's the forecast for the insurance industry? Um, and this is such a great conference because it tells you so much as you look all the way across it longitudinally to get to this point. It's almost feel like I'm doing a summary more than I have to present a lot of the information. So government, government sponsored programs, what we've heard is they're stable. Um, they may return to more historical growth rather than the influx they got from ACA. So you should look for any insurers who had a big influx because of ACA now have to figure out how to replicate that growth going forward. They'll look for ways to do that, but it's generally a stable market. We don't see that changing in any way. Um, commercial employers, um, we heard in the first panel, and Dr. Glassman, thank you, showing that we are growing it. The commercial employment is growing in single digits. Again, maybe not historical, but it's stable, it's growing. We've even seen uh, pay and benefits, otherwise known as labor costs, rising. So everything to assume that our employers are base for that market is going to continue to be there and continue to grow. Medical cost uh, trends, which we heard from uh, John, thank you very much, are also in the low um, single digits. While still just shy double the CPI, they tend to be um, relatively low historically. And I think the quote was, would even lull employers into um, complacency. I may be paraphrasing, but uh, they've been pretty good. Um, I may stray into Cheryl's area just for this one little bit to say the financial results for the industry and its participants have actually been fairly good. Um, even when you think about Cigna's approach to value creation and how we've been going about it. Since uh, 2009, we've had an 11% compound annual growth in our revenue, uh, about 12% EPS growth. Um, and over the same period, we delivered a, a cumulative shareholder return of about 479%. I mean, kind of sounds like it's Miller time in the healthcare industry, right? I mean, everything seems to be going pretty well. Um, and I think it is easy to say that on the surface. And I think a lot of times when public and others look at it, they kind of look at the lamenting we do. But each one of the sectors actually looks like it's doing pretty well. And that rise in GDP up to the 17 bit, that is revenue that's flowing into the system. And it continues to, continues to rise every year. Um, but I would say that if you really look at it, um, I don't think it's all that under the hood. And I think there's a lot for us to do. Um, well, I'd agree with the previous speakers. A closer look at market forces would really tell you there's a lot of disruption still coming, although I think it's going to be different than it has been over the last couple of years. Um, the aging population, we're going to see a doubling of those people over 65 by 2050. Um, and for those of you who don't follow the insurance industry, although Jeff, I, I know a little bit about it, even though I'm from a carrier side uh, on the healthcare <laughs> parts of it. Um, uh, seniors tend to consume multiples of resources than young people do. So the more we increase that population, the more we're going to feel strained into that in the beginning of the trend. Um, fundamentally, there's a changing role of the consumer. High deductible plans and what we've been doing those and we've seen them along the way, well, that really puts a lot of pressure on a consumer to want to understand more of their care, begin to manage that expense, and it puts a lot of pressure on their personal financials. They now want tools, transparency, and clarity on how they're going to bear that responsibility, and they're looking for solutions to help them with financing it. Um, you can see, you continue to see a lot of consolidation in the industry. Um, you've seen it in all parts of the sector, although clearly the FTC and the courts have now sold you where the insurance carriers will stop on uh, horizontal in integration. Um, but you continue to see it in the provider community and others. And I would suggest that many of those consolidations, not all of them, but a good majority of them, have actually led to higher, not lower costs into the system. So John, that's where your price pieces are coming from as you watch very expensive um, participants buying very low cost participants. 
Um, you continued evolution of technology changes the way healthcare is accessed, the way it's delivered, it's measured. Um, again, a lot of these technological things, the increases in the drugs, prices, increase in some of these technologies moving from, gee, I've got an MRI, do I have an MRI that can do it open? Do I can do one that can do it in like two and a half minutes? These all exponentially increase the cost into the system, even if you're doing the same kind of diagnostic procedure. I get why they have to be done and why you get to it. But we should note that it is a cost pressure that goes in there. So even if you see utilization down, the severity of it continues to, to rise. And that was the other part I didn't hear this year, as I've heard in past years. Um, really, the health status of the population still is continuing to deteriorate. It's not like suddenly everybody got healthier and the chronic diseases are under control and moving. And that continues to put a lot of pressure into the system as well. And I think will continue to be a challenge for us as you go forward. And then finally, um, there is a, uh, an accumulation of 40 years of extensive, and while extensive, yet completely disparate and often conflicting legislation and regulation that has been introduced into almost every aspect of the sector, which makes it difficult um, for change to happen as things get entrenched that way. That said, um, it seems to be moving into a period of very rapid and fluid and volatile legislation and regulation. I mean, almost you have to follow it one tweet at a time lately. Um, and I've watched just sectors go up and down very rapidly as we're moving into it. So I do think there's going to be a lot of change, and there's a real willingness now to want to change those factors. All of those, when you put those together, there's some real profound implications as you look forward for the next three to five years in the health insurance industry of what you think will, will happen next. And I think there's a couple of themes um, that will come out of that. And, um, and as I think about the stakeholders, I thought I'd take two seconds and sort of put some of a summary of those implications. Um, individuals, they're really looking access for personalized, um, simplified, and affordable health care. That's pretty easy. I just want to understand what it is. I want to be able to get things covered. I want to work through those areas. Employers are really looking for costs to be transparent, and they're looking for them to be tailored to their very specific population needs. And they really want to really are trying to, and we heard it earlier yesterday, they want to get to an improvement in presenteeism and productivity. That's really what they want to get to to make sure their employees are healthy, happy, at work, and not just physically at work, but your head is there, and you're not home worried about parents, children, and your health issues and otherwise. Providers, uh, other healthcare professionals, many of you here, I won't tell you exactly what you're, you're looking for, you're each uh, individual, but everything I see rolls up to incentive-based programs. They're looking to leverage analytics and looking to optimize the resources that they have available to them. Um, communities, um, we hear from government, and rightly so. Communities are looking to improve their health. <laughs> They're really looking, we heard that uh, just even in the last panel. The health, the vitality, the production, uh, productivity of our population, that, that's what makes our country strong, that's what makes our economy strong, and it's important and a responsibility of this sector to provide that to this country. <laughs> um, so among these stakeholder needs, if you pull together kind of a common theme, I would tell you the personalization and affordability, and I'll define those in just a second, um, and predictability. That's really where I think the battlefield will be defined for the next three to five years in the health insurance space. Um, I did want to take a note, though, as I noticed in the last few days and even over the last few sessions, over the years, um, sort of the critique of the health insurance industry and the speed of change, and we sort of lament that. And I even heard uh, Dean yesterday, who I don't think is here, um, kind of noting the telephone to Candy Crush and how fast that moved. You know, I'd, I'd keep in mind um, the pace of change in any industry can only move as fast as the next possible transaction. So if you were looking for a telephone, you had to wait until a third party brought a phone wire to your house physically before you could actually purchase that transaction. Candy Crush, you could go down to any app store, Google Play or whatever, you put it on, you could actually even purchase another, another game before that one even finished downloading onto your phone. So the speed of that. When you think about the healthcare insurance industry, and think about even in this room, when we meet here again next year, and after my speech, you definitely will not have me back up here, um, <laughs> yeah, many of you will have only had one opportunity to make a different choice on the healthcare insurance that you have today, provided by a third party. Many of you may only even have the opportunity to re-enroll in the choice you've already made. And if you're under a government program, you may have not had any choice at all. Um, so the speed at which our industry can move is really heavily limited by that. So always keep that in mind as you look at it. It's when can you make the next possible transaction as you can think about transformation and change. 
Um, so, choice. Um, I think that's probably the biggest thing and I, that we need to think about as we think about personalization and affordability. And I also think it's when we were talking about earlier um, what differentiates us from other countries and other systems. Why do single payer struggle? Um, and others, uh, Americans, man, we love choice. Um, we don't always take advantage of those choices, um, but, and we also, by the way, have the right to make a bad choice. So if anyone's thinking we're gonna get a perfectly optimal system, you can you know, forget that. Um, but we do like to make choices. Um, and choices is what we really begin to hear in the system. And it's, I think, something as an industry, strategically, we have to address better than we have before. Um, but no doubt, uh, they want choice. Employers at the plant designs, you know, every provider I talk to in the groups, um, they all want their own specific measures. They want it specifically to their patients. They like it real time, and they would like it um, to deliver it in the way in the media and format that works for them, as does our employers, as do our consumers um, along the way. And by the way, as do our regulators. Um, not to suggest that any state or regulator may want a different format or otherwise, but they do, um, you know, which is why we have a really large IT department. Um, innovation, um, so along personalization and that, and what I just described in the gaps there, that's really where I think you're going to see the most visible innovation. And I think we saw it in the last panel um, with Jeffrey and others. Um, the disruption, the new entrants, they're moving around the edges as an interface between the system, whether it's us as a health insurer or the providers, and the consumer. That space right there, that is where you're going to continue to see the innovation coming in. Um, I think you'll see the uh, carriers want to continue to work into that place as well. Um, if you think all of them have a better or, or not um, system or interface or disintermediation of the insurance industry, um, the point would be is clearly the status quo it, in a technical term that I learned in my MBA, it sucks. Um, it, and, it, and that's why you have a gap. Um, the gap is there and that's where the entrants are going, that's where the VC money heads, that's where the competition will come is how do you interface in a seamless, in a way that is personalized, in a way that gets standardized, in a way that is affordable. Um, consumers, I would also note, um, they see healthcare as much, um, and I've really been doing a lot of studies on it, much broader than the benefit plan. So even though we focus very heavily on the benefit plan and we focus, and we focus on those areas, consumers see health much further than that. It's about whether you went to Whole Foods or Trader Joe's or whether you went to Stater Brothers or whether you, wherever you might go. It's about cosmetic care, it's about vitamins and supplements, about walking, it's about what they do. Healthcare is, is so much more uh, for them than it is just uh, the benefit plan. And I think you will see also innovation in carriers beginning to move into that space and you begin to see it. It's moved the wellness plans, get into exercise programs, they get into strategic alignments with menu operations, with how do you refer them into nutrition. Other is you begin to see the creep of uh, the carriers into those spaces as well in the supply chain. And you'll see it also in the providers, the others as well. So competition, consumer experience, and again, uh, the broadening into how a consumer defines health. Um, so um, affordability, uh, really that's the, the crux of so personalization. Think about affordability. Um, affordability is the, the holy grail in our industry. We've been talking around it for the better part of two days and we continue to. Um, I think we've probably spent the last 40 years as an as a industry in a whole focusing on each one of the stakeholders, but individually. Um, if you think about it and step back glacially, you know, we, we focused on um, you know, providers when we had things back like PAC CSR, the developing of networks, the discounts, all of those controls. That was around getting that, trying to work on that stakeholder. HMOs was really about the, the rise and fall, was the focus on the consumer and that utilization and finding a way in which to put that in place. Consumers balked it again because they lost choice. We need to not forget that part. Um, and we've also focused on the healthcare insurers. Uh, MLR requirements, all the benefit mandates, things like that are about managing this particular sector of the operation as well. I'm not saying they, they, any of those or all of those were, were needed or not, but, but that really was the intent, was to work through those pieces and how to control them. And the pharmaceutical company, which has enjoyed all the loving and care of the FDA, now seems to have a lot more friends wanting to come spend time with them relative to how they price and how they put in drugs and others. And I think we're going to focus for a while on that stakeholder. Um, all those initiatives and tactics, I, I think there were some short-term gains from them, and we've seen it. But I would tell you none of them was really sustainably successful. 
Um, and I think it's because they focused on each stakeholder in isolation as opposed to going forward. And that really brings to the place where I see the most hope and where I see the industry really heading and really been excited as I look forward. Uh, I am very optimistic about where the industry is headed over the next three, five years, because we're really starting to look at where the stakeholders interact. You can see themes of it throughout different parts of it. When you think about where does all medical costs come from? All medical costs comes from is when you or I are sitting in a physician's office on the crunchy white paper, that is where medical cost occurs. Um, and when you think about it, we've spent a lot of time trying to, and I love these words, by the way, I, I really want to encourage you in the industry, if you want to think about our language, our language is terrible. Um, think of all the words we use. I want you to close your eyes, envision your spouse, your mother, your father, your friend, go home and tell them how you're going to steer them to a good decision. Right? Tell them how you're going to, you know what, I'm here to um, engage you and make sure that you go ahead and get to the right choice that I think you ought to be making. We use a lot of gatekeepers. We use a lot of forced language in this sector. Um, not what I would say is very consumer centric and one that I think is an industry and I personally have been on a uh, mission to, uh, to really think about the language we use because I think it makes a difference on how we approach um, each one of the stakeholders. Um, and back to that, so you're in there, you're in the office, um, and everyone talks about pharmaceutical costs. And we've talked about the issues with the formularies, we talk about the drug pricing and others, and we have developed consumer tools for our consumers to go in there. But when you think about it, who is best positioned in that room to make the trade-off decision between the cost benefit of a drug on a formulary and the consumer is going to pay? Right? I'm going to argue it's the person who went to medical school and is trained in diagnosis and treatment of disease versus in that seven minutes, the second half of that, that appointment, a consumer is going to pull out their app and try to figure out which drug on their formulary is the right one. As an industry, we need to move to how we enable and facilitate that interaction between stakeholders, not try to control. It's got to be a way in which we find the stakeholder that is in the best position to help influence and have them work collaboratively. Both players need that information. I'm not saying don't give it to consumers. We have a consumer app, we provide that information. It's important, uh, but I think it's also important that that same information about that individual is with the provider as well. And then who else is in that room, right? Who else is in there? Uh, broker consultants, you designed a benefit plan, you educated the employees on what that plan was, you worked with the employer, we provided those pieces, we have rules, regs, and other things in places. There's contracts that that provider has with us and things that go through it, there's contracts they have with hospitals, steering, all that. We, we have to work together to have those work in concert, they have to work to, not a, an opposition. And that's really what I'm seeing in the collaborative cares and the ACO. So do I think it's all perfect yet? I, I don't. Um, do I think that's the right way to go? It is. It's data-based. We're looking for who's performing well, who's not. And once a consumer makes that decision or gets that treatment, the role is really to facilitate their compliance with the treatment plans. Um, and that's really a strategy where we're headed. It, it, if you disagree with it, um, or if we clinically think there's something else, I think that's a dialogue you have to go back and have with the primary care physicians, but I don't think it's one you use control mechanisms on a consumer. That's not really where it happens because there's a worse choice, right? The worst choice is the consumer does nothing. The consumer stayed home, didn't seek care, has an issue, and ends up a catastrophic claimant, not just in terms of cost, but in terms of what it does to their life. Those diseases left untreated are far worse than if we treat them. So encouraging primary care, getting us to the right spot, working with primary care to educate and facilitate their interaction with consumers, and then once consumers and the physician make a choice, facilitating that choice, that's really where you see the industry headed, and that really feels like the right way to be headed. And then aligning those incentives so that today, if you're a physician and you cut loose a script of any kind, is there any financial incentive alignment to you in any way, shape, or form? Maybe. Maybe if you're employed somewhere, maybe someone retrospectively, but generally, not, not really related. It's something else. We have to find a way where all of us win at the same time, or we all lose at the same time. Maybe not in the same proportions, but it has to be aligned incentives. That is really where you see, where I see the hope of the industry and where I see the insurance sector headed. And it sounds like I'm talking through this. I'm talking about personalization at the same time. And the reason why is, I don't think they're either or. 
I don't think it's personalization or affordability. I don't think it's managing the cost or meeting consumer needs. I think meeting the consumer and the provider and the other stakeholders' personalized needs is the pathway to affordability. Um, and I think, too, again, as an industry, we've thought about it two separately. And I think those are really the same thing. And I'm seeing a lot of the strategies and, and things moving towards that. So if you want a strategic outlook for you know, the insurance industry next three to five years, I think our, our market base is stable. I think you'll continue to see us um, work in those areas. I think you'll see more and more collaboration taking place amongst the stakeholders as we begin to work better to align it as opposed to, hey, it's that one, or it's this one, or it's my fault, or somebody's fault, but really kind of working together at it. And I also think you're gonna see a lot more innovation and a lot of the, the um, the entrance coming in right in that interface between consumers, providers, and the system. I think that's where you'll see a lot of it. And then again, those uh, carriers who had a big influx of ACA, I think you'll see them look or find other ways to grow in order to continue to, to meet their stakeholder, shareholder needs. Um, and so that may be uh, you know, reformatting or moving down into the supply chain uh, to find a margin. But I think that's, you know, the consolidation horizontally, I don't think you really see much more of that in, in the health carrier space. Um, with that, um, I would like to conclude my remarks and thank you very much for inviting me and having me. As always, it's a pleasure and, and the school does a great job with it and I hope you would see where each one of the presentations of the last two days kind of leads up to and how you get to a strategic outlook uh, because it really is a very valuable um, conference that I enjoy going to every year. So thank you very much.